to start out on a um, period of uh, kind of reflection, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence. Um, the Rancho mourns the tragic murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmoud Aubrey, and communities of color have experienced systematic violence and operation and oppression during this period. And as you all know, Rancho Los Cerritos is a space for everyone of every race. And as a history museum, we are tasked with telling the stories of the entire community, especially voices that have been historically silenced, in this case, black voices. And early, earlier this year, as many of you know, we began working with a consultant to create a DEIA statement diversity, equity, inclusiveness, and accessibility. And while we haven't completed it, we are in the middle of what that looks like. And we eventually, and will want your input on what that statement and our commitment to this community looks like. So at this point, I just wanted to ask everyone to take a moment to reflect on what is happening in our communities. Um, and so I would ask that you do that now, um, just to honor what is happening and what we need to do to respect our communities. And with that, I want to thank all of you for being so committed to the Rancho, the history that we share and the communities that we represent and can share their stories about. And while we need to do more work on this, we are committed to making that happen. And I know we have all of the volunteers commitment to that. And we will be asking for your input on how we move forward with that. So thank you all for being here, for sharing history, for being committed to the true stories of our communities. And with that, I turn it over. Laura. Welcome everybody. I am so happy to see many of you here today, many of you that have, are new and that are returning. This is our third virtual gathering. The first one was replacement for the unfortunately canceled um, volunteer appreciation dinner, which someday we hope to have. At that one, we got to, on the very same night, we would have all been gathering. We got to hear from the Mill Rock team and the wonderful work they did to um, refurbish and restore the living room. Our next virtual gathering, we um, had a wonderful uh, presentation from Sarah about how she created and collaborated with the Tongva community to bring that um, display to the Rancho. And we also had that wonderful show that um, Marie made of uh, the beautiful things that unfortunately all of you missed blooming at the Rancho, but I thought that was quite a good replacement treat. And now this brings us to the present. We are at our third gathering, but we have been able to see many of each other in person. And that has been very exciting as the Rancho reopened over the last two weeks. And a lot of these faces I got to see there. I like you to know that the first week we welcomed 91 people onto the Rancho with uh, the help of a lot of you volunteers that I see here tonight. And then the next week when we opened to the public, 161 people came to see the Rancho and that was a lot of fun for all of us. So we have a lot of fun to, uh, ahead of us tonight. We have Steve Iverson, a fellow volunteer, former curator, has been doing some very interesting research about the um, 
the Chinese laborers here at the Rancho and also at the uh, Los Alamitos. And we're gonna be sharing that with you. Uh, Megan's gonna have some more fun polls and I'm going to let you see, see what it looked like at the Rancho. So let's turn it over to Megan. Hi, so glad to have you all here. Um, tonight, fun poll number one, we're not gonna ask where you're zooming in from, we already know. Okay, that was from our first gathering. We're not gonna ask what you do at the Rancho because we know you do a ton. Tonight, I'm gonna ask approximately how many volunteer hours you have accumulated. Are you just starting out, is it under 50? Or have you earned your volunteer badge? 51 to 100 hours. Maybe you were a long, long, long time volunteer. I think I saw Gail there. She's only the most recent of three to accumulate over 3,500 hours. Laura has her calculator out. I'm quite sure of that. We have a few more people still. Uh, we call it voting, but really what you're doing is clicking on the number of volunteer hours you estimate you have completed or which category. And once we have everyone in there, I will be happy to share the results. Panelists, you're actually allowed to vote. If you see it up on the screen, you are welcome to, although I think Steve is only our, our only true volunteer but I'm gonna guess both Alana and Laura accumulated a substantial, substantial number of hours before they actually were hired on our team. Okay, I'm gonna give you about 30 more seconds if you would like to weigh in. Laura's gonna have a lot of numbers to add here. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh my goodness, can you see? all of those we have about six people who are just starting out under uh, 50 hours five people so 11 all together who are between zero and 100 hours we do have gail indeed at 3501 but we have three people who have accumulated more than 2,000 hours three more who, who've accumulated over a thousand hours and several uh, in the 250 to 500 hour category that is a lot of volunteer hours. No wonder our rancho is so incredibly well-maintained, well-gardened. And we do have Sandra who's joining us from YouTube and she's not sure her exact number, but she's already earned her volunteer badge. So she's got a few under her belt as well. Oh, fantastic, awesome. So now you can see the results, not just have me tell you about them, that's a lot of hours. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask a second question. June, of course, is graduation season. And we know that a lot of people are missing their graduations. And so first, I wanted to be very silly and show you what I look like as a graduate. So there you go. And now I want to ask you what your favorite subject in school was. This can be high school subject or college subject, your choice. Go ahead and tell us if it was the physical sciences like math and biology and chemistry or the humanities like English and language arts, physical education, foreign language, social science. And I do know that some people put history in the social sciences and some people put history in the humanities. Someone says other, you're gonna have to tell us what other is. Alana, do we have anyone weighing in from YouTube or in the chat? Um, not yet from YouTube, although it is slightly behind, so we might get um, an answer too soon. Um, but Tessa says, obviously, history in the chat. That's the right answer, Tessa. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, and, and Marcia said that other was yearbook. Oh, fabulous. Okay. My sister was big in yearbook. Uh, history social science is the winner with a close runner up or uh, runner up or runner up of English language arts, but we do have some math and scientists. We do have somebody who loves foreign language. And uh, that's that sounds about right. I was a communication major, although I went to college, uh, <clears throat> supposedly going to major in math. And I came out of college with uh, Bo, who's in the picture there. His name's Greg. He's been my husband for almost 27 years. All right, I'm gonna now introduce uh, our guest speaker. So let me, let me tell you about this guy. Most of you already know him, Steve Iverson. I had the pleasure when I first came to the Rancho, and I mean first came to the Rancho, of sitting in the library with him and with Ellen Calamiris to be interviewed for my job. That was somewhere back in 2003. And Steve and Ellen asked me if I knew what a uh, docent is, and I did, although I didn't have a background in museums. And they asked me if I knew what living history was. And I think I made up a reasonable enough answer that they went ahead and offered me the job. Uh, and it was City of Long Beach at that point. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with Steve for, for a number of years. He has been a retired, very active volunteer, but he was our curator for my first 10 or 12 years on staff. Steve and I um, co-taught our docent training classes, um, but I always defer to Steve, as many of you know, even after he retired. That's a great question for Steve, meaning I have no clue and I never thought to ask that before, but Steve has such extensive knowledge of the Rancho that if he doesn't know the answer, he's gonna spend the time to go find out. Um, Steve, before he came to the Rancho, I know he had a passion for education as well as a background in making cabinetry. And so I understand that one of the first things he did was to install our blacksmith shop I know one of the last things he did as curator was to install our laundry room. But in between, he did an awful lot of organizing of our archives, of expanding our knowledge of what the rancho is and what its history is. And is it any surprise that he has not quit these endeavors? He continues to volunteer many, many Tuesdays. And now we find out way beyond that as well because he has put together an incredible opportunity for us to all learn more about the Chinese labor at Alamitos and Cerritos in the research he has continued to do. I want to give a quick shout out to Pam Lee, who's joining us tonight from Rancho Los Alamitos for helping Steve uh, get access to some of these sources. Um, I can't wait to find out. Are you ready, Steve? I, yes. Okay. Yes, can can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, that's what I need to know. Um, yes, welcome all you volunteers and staff members um, to my uh, little presentation. And I re really am proud of all of the things that you are continuing to do, and I am heartened by the, the uh, number of people you've had visit already. Um, this isolation period that we've gone through has given me lots of extra hours to continue the research that I actually began in August. Um, and uh, it, it was at that time that I felt compelled, I guess, to um, look into some in some uh, resources that I hadn't checked out before. Uh, like so many things that we had to do when I was on staff, there wasn't enough time to cover everything. Um, but I have been able to uh, go through a series of um, ledgers, journals, and uh, account books at Rancho Los Alamitos. Thank you folks for making them available. Their archival collection includes quite a few that cover the entire farming period all the way up into oh, around 1950, I believe. 
And um, the, the 31 books that I've been able to go through uh, were, be, were from a series begun by John William Bixby, uh, with whom I think you're familiar. Uh, he came, uh, and we've actually found him in, uh, let's see, we've got to find the right button here. Okay. Uh, he was a cousin of Jotham and Llewellyn Bixby uh, and came to, in fact, he was also a cousin of the Flints. He came to uh, California in 1870 or 71. He was still listed in Maine uh, in the, at the census time in 1870. And he came to the Rancho uh, was encouraged to uh, accept the job of looking, of overseeing some of the sheep operations and working very hard for uh, uh, Jotham Bixby and uh, Jay Bixby and Company. He also met uh, Mrs. Bixby's sister, Susan, and they fell in love and were married. Most of you know these stories of, from the two ranchos and the background training you've had. Uh, John and Susan, after their marriage, October 4th, 73, went, moved to Wilmington, and they were there until early in, apparently early in 1878. Uh, at that time, they rented or leased the, uh, the hilltop property with the ranch buildings. Uh, John was in the process of building up some of his own flocks of sheep as well as maintaining some of the uh, other ranching operations at Los Cerritos. So we had both ranchos that were ever more closely associated. And in 1881, they became um, almost cemented together when uh, Los Alamitos came on the market. And John approached Jotham, and John approached uh, banker I.W. Hellman, and Flint Bixby and company participated with Jotham's third of it. John took a third and Hellman took a third of Rancho Los Alamitos. And they continued to convert to uh, sheep operations. Now John had a wonderful experience, some wonderful experiences and progress in, uh, at the rancho and even before that. Uh, unfortunately, he, he contracted uh, appendicitis and the, uh, uh, died of the, of the peritonitis or infection that resulted. And at that time, Jotham's uh, eldest son, George H. Bixby, took over some of the finances. Now, from John's first day in, uh, or first period of living in California, um, he began pretty much by uh, uh, working with the various uh, businessmen in Los Angeles as he was building up some of his own business and herds. And when he was there, of course, he had to do his laundry. And we found an entry, his earliest entry here of uh, paying a, China, a Chinese launderer, uh, at which time uh, the, the fee was uh, a dollar for 12 pieces. And at this time he had nine pieces uh, to be washed. So he paid 75 cents. Um, this is one of the books that he began. Uh, this one was a camp book and is less formal condition to a journal or ledger. Now he's, it, I, a lot of my focus on this particular um, project is uh, focused on the full ranching operations at Los Alamitos. But the Chinese workers have always been one of my uh, 
areas of curiosity. And of course, I was very pleased when Sarah was able to put together that uh, Chinese exhibit in the visitor center downstairs. Uh, this is some of the table showing the, the, uh, some of the things I picked out from about 500 or more entries of Chinese uh, persons, many of them by name, but there were about uh, 50 that were not named. They were simply listed as Chinamen in the, in the various books. The most important one, obviously, is the first here, Ah Fan. Uh, and I'll explain how we came to know that he, his full name was Fan Fong. He's the one who Ying trained at the Rancho and served here. Uh, well, let's see. We found that he claimed to have come to California from China in 1874. And... Uh, he was here into well into the 20th century. Uh, Fan worked as understudy for Ying at Rancho Los Cerritos. And then we found that he started, he commenced work as John entered in his uh, account book on August 26th, 1872. So that, by the way, is shortly after Jotham Bixby and Margaret and their family moved to Los Angeles uh, just a, a, maybe a, a little less than a year later. Uh, over the time that he worked at Los Alamitos, he started out at $35 a month and his wages were raised to eventually $45 a month. Uh, what we found is most people who were working, most of the regular ranch workers, including the herders, were initially paid 15, 20, or $25 a month. Uh, in fact, almost always in round numbers. Uh, and a lot of the Chinese who were hired were paid comparable wages. Uh, there didn't seem to be a great deal of wage discrimination, at least at Rancho Los Alamitos. Um, from the earliest hire of a Chinese person in the domestic department, Jim Chinaman here was the, uh, the one who got $25 a month, but he only worked for four months. And uh, so that came out to a little over $100. One of the most interesting groups of workers was the entry for Ditch Chinaman. Now, one of the things John was doing after he moved into Los Alamitos was trying to uh, make sure there was enough water on the site for all of the sheep camps and any of the crops that he was growing. And so at this point in time, he hired a group, and we don't know how many were in this group, of Chinese workers to dig a ditch, probably a, an irrigation ditch from most likely the San Gabriel River that flowed through the rancho. And they were paid $1.25 a day, which was a fairly standard wage uh, for something that was that hard to, or that difficult to process of working. Um, the, the, the final payment, they worked for 691 days and received $864 as an aggregate. So if you divide that out, um, you just have no idea because you don't know how many Chinese were working at that project. Um, so we don't know exactly how long it took them to dig this particular ditch project. Um, Akin was another one who was listed there and uh, he was probably the second longest Chinese worker hired at Rancho Los Alamitos over the years. A um, couple of them are a little bit more mysterious. Uh, down at the bottom of the chart here, Wo Chung Hong. We don't know exactly what his position was at the Rancho. He was listed in 11 different entries out of, well, there are a total of about 4,000, almost 4,500 pages of 
entries in these 31 different accounting books. And Wo Chung Hong is listed in 11 entries for a fairly short period in 1887. Uh, and he's listed among some of the other workers and therefore it doesn't appear that he was one of the domestic staff that, that most of these other Chinese workers uh, were part of. Couple interesting things here. Let's see. This is uh, the entry for Fan, uh, Fan's first um, entry in the, in the account books. And it says, by commenced work, August 26th. And it gives his rate of pay. This is a common uh, method of entering the account, uh, the, um, the financial transactions in, in the account books by John Bixby and uh, in different locations that uh, we, we have found some duplication of entries because from the day book where something is paid out the first time, it would be transferred into an, a second book or ledger and they used the double entry accounting system. So you had two columns, one here and one here, and you balance that every entry in one column has to reflect the entry in another. So um, if you purchased something for $45, that goes out of your, uh, your debits and comes in as a credit in the other column because now you have that item which you spent that money for. Uh, in this case, we've got uh, again, Fan is listed here for, uh, and another Chinese goon is interested, in, uh, entered for receiving uh, part of their pay and some of the other transactions that they've made. For example, uh, in one instance we found where um, Fan was, uh, reimbur was reimbursed $3.35 for a laundry bill that he'd paid out of his own personal funds because apparently Mr. or Mrs. Bixby was not available to pay the laundry man at that moment. I had to throw one photograph in, and this is from the Rancho Los Cerritos collection. Uh, John Bixby's oldest brother was Augustus Simon Bixby, and he started out in sheep ranching at, uh, in California, up in the north, not far from the San Justo, uh, in partnership with George Moore, and eventually they came to Southern California. Uh, they did run sheep on uh, what became the Irvine Ranch for a while until conditions uh, were dry enough that there wasn't enough forage for all of their sheep and then they got thrown off of it. But that was a rancho that uh, Flint Bixby and Company was a 50% partner of, of um, James Irvine. Now after that, uh, the family of Augusta Simon Bixby lived up in uh, Sierra Madre for a while, and he continued to do some a little bit of sheep ranching, but he branched into some other areas, and eventually the family ended up in Pasadena. But his cook through a lot of the 1870s was Kuo Lang, and this particular card or photograph card was made and given to that family and we believe the Chinese on the, uh, the writing on this reflects his home village and address if, if the family wanted to send this, send anything to him. So this would be a typical uh, of a well-respected Chinese cook who was coming, fairly becoming close to the family itself. Now, Fan Fong was interesting because in 1888, this was following the death of John Bixby, 
he was among a dozen different ranch workers who invested in property. Now, significant to Southern California history, this was during the period of the great land boom of the 1880s. Uh, it resulted from uh, the, um, a combination of booster uh, pamphlets and books and uh, letters that were sent out from people in Los Angeles and in Southern California to all around the world to try to promote people to come to California. And at this same time, starting in 1885, the Santa Fe Railroad arrived in Southern California and offered competition and therefore a price war with the Southern Pacific at the time. And so this great land boom brought so many people that the price of properties went up. There were many, many co new communities that were uh, laid out, surveyed, and uh, various developers were trying to sell the uh, land. And John Bixby had started out his Alamitos Beach on the far west side of Rancho Los Alamitos. Uh, one of the people who bought was Fan. And because of that, we know that his last name was Fong. He paid one third down in January, another third in May, and the final third in June. Okay, note here the Southern California land boom, and we'll talk about a couple of these other things in just a moment. Fan, where'd this go? There we go. Um, Fan purchased that and we found an entry where he registered it for $1.60 uh, in, at the courthouse in Los Angeles. So he was a, 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 a true property owner because of that sale in 1888. Now, at that point, we had already had a new constitution in California, the 1879 one. And shortly after that, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was not repealed until 1943. The California Constitution included a restriction on ownership of land by people of Asian uh, background. And the, the actual wording said, foreigners of the white race or of African descent eligible to become citizens of the United States under the naturalization laws thereof, while bona fide residents of this state shall have the same rights in respect to the acquisition, possession, enjoyments, transmission, and inheritance of property as native born citizens. What, what was left out was that between white race or African descent, which was the most, most of the population of our nation, uh, the, those of Asian descent were deemed not eligible for citizenship. And so the fact that Fan Fong had purchased that uh, property in Alamedas uh, Beach is uh, real interesting. We don't know exactly how they got that through, but Fan continued to own it Come here. Um, and he is still listed in the LA census, the US census in 1900. Uh, at this point, he claimed he had entered the country in 1874, was age 45. Now, 20 years before that, he had only claimed to be 21. So there's some discrepancies in different uh, uh, census uh, documents that we find. Uh, people did not always hear the same thing that was said or ask the right questions and get the right answers. But this, at this point, he is also listed as married, which he wasn't earlier. 
And it's possible that he had gone back to China at some time during this period of his living in the country and uh, took on a bride at that point. Or it's also possible that he was married um, in absentia by uh, one of these, uh, uh, I'm losing the words here, one of these uh, marriages by uh, proxy, which was not an uncommon thing also for uh, Chinese laborers living in the, in the US. He, his two lots, uh, what we've got here is a bit of Long Beach, but at this time it was Alameda's Beach as surveyed by, by Mr. Healy and Mr. Sweeney. The two lots that he purchased are east of Alamitos Avenue or Boulevard. And in one of them is in block 61, the other one in block 69, right close to Alamitos Park, which had been established by John Bixby as part of his uh, uh, original layout of Alamitos Beach, which was of course subsequently annexed by the city of Long Beach. So he, he still owned those two lots up until 1908 when he finally sold them. Now his, he had paid $817 during the land boom. And here you see that he sold them for $10 but interestingly to another Chinese person. Uh, this is one of the, the fun mysteries that we've come up with. Why, why was he allowed to buy them in the first place? And um, what, what could he have done and why was the person who he sold them to allowed to purchase them? Um, there were a couple other, let's see, a couple other mysteries that came up. One of the interesting things was that uh, there was an, a listing of several entries in the books for someone named Yang. Now that we think is probably not the same Ying that had trained uh, Fan and who had been a cook at Rancho Los Cerritos but it was interesting that that name crops up that second time. And at that point he is selling potatoes and hogs and such to the rancho, to Rancho Los Alamitos uh, up in, in the, uh, the late 1880s. Uh, there's several other things that come up, but that is the general gist of, of the uh, research that I found as it relates to the Chinese. And uh, there are going to be other little things that I, I have written out, but which are not uh, included in this because I'm trying to keep this to 20 minutes and I think I've been a close. So I thank you for that and uh, welcome any questions you might have. Steve, I can stop sharing your screen now, right? There yeah, we go. looking for oh, the right okay. button. We have a question from um, Pam Lee, and she's asking, were the Chinese able to own land in California at that time? Not as far as we can tell, uh, because this was after the Chinese Exclusion Act, and that was 1882. We haven't found, I haven't found anything definite except the constitution of 79 that includes that. Before that, they were severely restricted. I do not know if there was a specific law against it. But I, may have been I will continue to research that. And thank do you. Have any, do we have any information about Ying's salary at Rancho Los Cerritos, if it was probably comparable to that $40 that Fan got at Alamitos? 
I expect it to have been very comparable. Um, he seemed to have been well respected by the family. Unfortunately, none of the Los Cerritos account books were, you know, were preserved. Uh, there are a few, there are quite a few entries in three of those uh, books that I looked through from Los Alamitos that have entries of, about the Cerritos. And, but most of them cover the sheep ranching and uh, such things as shearing uh, rather than anything uh, dealing with some of the other farming and ranching operations and domestic expenses. Um, Marsha is asking, did the Big Spies communicate in Chinese or English with the workers? Yes, probably all in English. Uh, the Big Spies probably did not have opportunity to learn uh, any Chinese and uh, most of the time the Chinese did not learn a lot of English. Uh, it was pidgin, as we call it, rather ungrammatical in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's interesting that Fan by 1900 in the census claimed to be able to speak English and I possibly read and write in English. He certainly could in Chinese. And we have a couple questions from the chat. So I'll, I'll go back. Tessa was asking, do we know where he went after he sold his property in 1908? No, we don't. Again, it, like so many of the people in, in these 31 account books, uh, once they're not listed, they sort of disappear from history unless you have other corroborating documents somewhere. And, uh, I haven't found it yet. And right now I'm sort of limited on how much more I can uh, approach other archives to look for other information because of the uh, isolation. And then Leslie noticed that on the carte de visite of Kuo Lang, um, on the backside, it said temple block. Could you say any more about that? Oh yeah, that's... Um, you had two, two main buildings in Los Angeles during that early period. Uh, one was John Temple's courthouse, which um, had been, I think it probably existed into the 1880s or 90s. And then his younger brother, F.P.F. Temple, built uh, a newer and more extensive temple block to the north of the first courthouse. And in that building, uh, quite a few prominent businesses and attorneys had their offices. And of course, one of them was Wolfenstein, who uh, eventually, according to Harris Newmark, went back to Sweden uh, shortly after, like about 1878. So he was only a photographer in Los Angeles for maybe three or four years. Uh, almost contemporaneously with William Godfrey, who took the pictures of Rancho Los Cerritos. That's Thank more you. than I really wanted to hear. <laughs> and um, so Pam Lee's also been active in our chat. So she had a recommendation um, for you to check out the Harada House and Harada family in Riverside. Um, who she thinks were in the Supreme Court case re regarding Asians owning land in the United States. But she also had a, a couple questions um, wondering if there's any way of tracking down Fan's wife and family, or do they show up on any other census records? They were probably, they probably never lived here. They probably continued to reside in China. Um, and there's a couple good books that talk about that sort of a lifestyle. Of course, one of them being The Good Earth by Pearl Buck. And more recently, uh, Lisa sees On Gold Mountain. Uh, she is real good about describing what her family was like and the uh, common uh, situation where Chinese wives were left in China 
and uh, where they raised their children there. Thank you. And Mark is wondering, were the purchased lots ever developed? I don't know. I doubt it. Probably not while, probably not while Ben uh, owned them and maybe while his, uh, the purchaser owned them. But that's, again, it's one of those things that you would have to go to the uh, formal records in the courthouse to see what kind of uh, building permits might have been there, what kind of changes in the assessment value of the property would, would have uh, uh, suggested. And we have another question. Uh, were any of the Chinese house workers married and living at the Rancho? Probably not, but it's possible. Um, none of the others show up on the 1880 census records, uh, at least as, as far as I've discovered. And of course, the 1890 census records were all destroyed in a fire, so we don't have anything else in that, you know, covering the both ends of that particular decade. Um, there is one of the biggest problems we've had is locating uh, more information on these Chinese workers. Uh, we do have some good descriptions of what the Chinese cook in a household would do, how his daily schedule would work, uh, how he would assign, for example, the dishwashing, the serving of meals, and the cleanup to his assistant, because many of them had assistants. And, um, but there just isn't information that has been saved uh, um, beyond the names. And in most of these names, when people are listed, they are listed only in, in John and uh, George H's documents here, only as by their, by their common name, which I wouldn't say, which in English would be their first name. Uh, although it's interesting that there are 16 different names listed or persons listed by their Chinese names in these uh, account books. Uh, only one of them has three names which suggests uh, a more prestigious background. And only Fan Fong listed with, is listed with two names. Others are given the appellation Ah, as in Ah Kin, Ah Soon, Ah Ha. Uh, those are all names that are listed and only in a few cases um, are the names listed. Otherwise, they are listed as Fan Chinaman or Soon Chinaman or Fu Chinaman. And it's, it suggests the continued uh, prejudices and discriminations, but uh, it's interesting that Fan was apparently able to go a little further uh, toward, an, toward uh, a normal uh, reputation within the uh, the, the major uh, community, society. Steve, your, your presentation has sparked a lot of interest. We have two final questions and they're on different notes. Um, one is, uh, it seems like such a tremendous journey for someone not only to come from China, but to go back when you talk about the wives often uh, raising their children at home suggests that somebody was traveling in one direction or another if there are indeed children from the Union. How, how likely was it that someone, or how frequently could someone do that? That's one question. On a different note, uh, living quarters. You, you mentioned that they're usually single workers. Were they provided living quarters? And if so, what sort of living quarters? Well, um um, probably not the best living quarters, but part of the employment agreement is that uh, all of the workers were given room and board as part of it. Um, so we know, for example, that there was a bunk situation. 
uh, in what was then the utility room between the kitchen and the dining room at Rancho Los Cerritos. And I suspect that somewhere near the kitchen in that wing of uh, Rancho Los Alamitos, there were accommodations for a uh, fan and whichever assistant he was working with at that time. That was very common. As far as traffic between California and China, or the US and China, uh, up until 1882 and the Chinese Exclusion Act, there was quite a bit of traffic. Uh, the goal for a Chinese person was to amass enough money to go back to China and to live in luxury and support his family and perhaps even his village. Um, and there was a lot of exchange that way. A lot of wives that stayed in China uh, raised sons and then maybe sent them to the U.S. to work with their fathers and to try to make their fortunes. Now, after the Exclusion Act, it was very difficult for those children and other family members, as well as new Chinese, to come to the U.S. After the earthquake and fire in San Francisco in 1906, however, Many, many documents were destroyed in the fire. So there was a great number of sons who came claiming to be part of families who had fathers in the U.S. and thus were permitted to bring in their children. And so these are called paper sons. And uh, they had a big influence on the number of Chinese in this country. There were never very many female Chinese that came in, except a few in the earliest days that were brought in for uh, recreational purposes. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for sharing all that. Uh, really, really fascinating. Um, let's see, we're gonna launch another poll and this one requires yet another change of background for me. <laughs> All right. Tell us which wildlife you have actually personally seen at Rancho Los Cerritos, and you can check all that apply before you press submit. Now, Steve, I think you were there when uh, we had sheep being uh, run with sheep dogs in, uh, in and around the backyard. So um, that's certainly something that I've seen. I've also seen horses in the backyard. Well, a horse because we had a cowboy come to day camp and he was riding a horse. A lot of people have seen the ducks that Laura took pictures of here behind me. Lizards, butterflies. Some of us have seen coyotes. Wouldn't be fair. Some of us have seen service animals when Marsha brings them or this big fluffy guy. Uh, I think Linnea was in that picture as well as Donald and maybe um, who else was in that picture, Laura? Mark Elliott. Mark Elliott, that's who it was, not Donald. Um, the bunny, super cute. Marie doesn't love him. She doesn't love those squirrels either. All right, I'm gonna give you another minute or so. I know you have to you have to think of who you saw. Steve and I might be the only one on this phone call who saw the sheep, although I'm I know there are some other longtime volunteers. Oh, there's one who also remembers seeing sheep at the rancho. We've also had some sh sheep shearing, not when I was on staff, but I hear that there was sheep shearing before that. Steve is nodding yes for those who can't see him. All right, I'm gonna end the poll in 20 more seconds. So if you wanna get your votes in, do it now. All right, I'm ending the poll in five, four, three, two, one. 100% of the people on this phone call have seen a butterfly at the rancho, that's fantastic. Uh, a lot of us have seen lizards and squirrels, 81% each. 
almost 40% have seen a coyote. And uh, that's tied with how many have seen a rabbit. You sort of have to be there in the early morning or the later afternoon. 5% have seen a horse and 10% have seen a, a sheep of some sort. How cool is that? We've had a lot of, a lot of animals at the rancho. And um, I'm gonna now take away this background and go with nothing because the next question is a little more solemn, I think, for a lot of us. The question is, what do you miss most? Which, you have to choose one. Which rancho event or type of event are you missing the most in recent months? Is it the in-person brown bags? There you go. Public tours, school tours, creation station. Maybe it's the bird walks. Maybe it's dusting and cleaning the artifacts or even indexing them. Maybe it's making garden crafts. Doing gardening, attending lectures or workshops, or in Steve's case, giving <laughs> lectures. If it's other, you can certainly tell us in the chat what it is. Oh, which brings up a point from last time. One of the other categories for favorite subject in school was dance, Miss Diana. I saw that belatedly. All right, I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds to finish submitting your answer. So if you haven't decided, I'm going to give you the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, hands down, it's public tours, but those are kind of coming back uh, for those who are volunteering as wayfinders and greeters. You know that uh, if we're a little distance, we can share a little bit of information. Um, coming in second, I think if I'm reading it right, is a tie between brown bags and school tours at 14% each. Creation Station, I wonder if that's Marsha or Sandra. Bird walks, um, curatorial, and then lectures and workshops. So many good things that the Rancho does and will do again, but either in a new way or in a or in a socially distanced way, sort of depending. Um, all right, I have just... We also have um, Krista from YouTube, Mrs. Storytime. And she also mentioned um, one of her favorite animals to see is the orange cat that lives in the neighborhood and visits uh, RLC occasionally. And I second that. It's a fun, fun time to see him walking around the rancho. Wow, okay. We used to actually have cats that were fed at the rancho, but I think we don't have those anymore. They used to do some mousing for us. All right, so I have lost my train here. So, Laura, are you picking it up? I think I'm picking it up here, yes. Um, it's been exciting the last two weeks to be back at the Rancho, seeing uh, many of you, and I have a fun slideshow to show you what it looks like. Those of you that haven't been able to be there and those of you that have are going to get to see yourselves. It looks a little bit different, but you know, I've noticed nobody complains about that they don't have to sign in anymore. But I want you to know, I am still keeping track of your hours. So you people out there on YouTube, all you people that I see here, I've already recorded your hours, but you people out there watching on YouTube, let me know you're watching it so I have some hours to record. With this pandemic, it's been less hours. I feel, I feel unimportant if there's no hours to record. So please let me know about those hours. I have looked at the last two virtual uh, gatherings. They both had over 30 views and nobody told me that they were watching. So I want to hear from you that you were here tonight. 
So let's get on with the show and I'm going to share my screen with you and show you some fun uh, stuff here at the Rancho. Did it go full screen? No, it's not in front. Not yet. You need to start from beginning. Yep. One back. Yep. Oh, where is my arrow? Uh, mm. won't go I don't have my arrow there's a thing here oh wait maybe if I close you that. should be able to use the um the yeah. arrows on your keyboard and if you go left it should go backwards here we are the beginning this is the very first day on the left you see a volunteer masked up there in the purple that's Adrienne and her friend were the very first to come to the rancho and you see a family there enjoying uh, their tour. They have their, un their paper tour there. Here's a picture of what it looks like where we're checking in. You can see the changing of the guard with uh, Donald and Linnea. And you see that we have the QR code so that you, the people can see the Clio tour on their computers or they can take a, uh, a brochure and take that around with them. If they didn't make a reservation, they can sign in on the iPad here. And we have a little slideshow going over um, what's expected in social distancing and all of the things we have listed here. And here is one of five uh, sanitation stations that uh, people can use as they travel around the rancho to stay safe. And here are some volunteers in action with the guests. Up here at the top, we see Fran Woods is uh, telling these guests about the garden. And we have with us tonight our, one of our very newest volunteers, Joyce Sherrado. And you probably, many of you are familiar with her because this is Martin Bell's wife, and she has already started volunteering at the Rancho, at, and she just um, retired like last week. She just jumped right in. Kim Vimowski here, uh, Tom Heaton, you see Lois, Jean Marquez, Cordia Butler, and uh, Gregory Jeffers sharing the Rancho. Here we have our gardeners getting grubby. You see Lori Adams up here in the corner, who I think is on here. I bet you're the person that's the phone call. There's Rashid and Chris Wesley. I'm pretty sure this is Gregory again over here by the trash can underneath that mask. And we have George and Steve looking a little surprised. I don't think Marie gave them a uh, heads up there. And Laura Breen. Here's some pictures of some of the beautiful things that have been blooming around the rancho. All the guests have really enjoyed seeing these purple berries on the Tasmanian flax lily. And the other day, Kim was uh, sitting at the registration desk and she was mesmerized by all of the different butterflies like this garden white here. And we see this middle one here, the rose apple blooms. Pretty soon we're gonna have those tasty treats dropping on the ground. And one of my favorites here is the cow itch tree. You see it's all covered in beautiful pink blooms. And here you see our um, herb garden that has just been um, cleaned up, weeded, planted, re the bricks have been relayed and re-manicured thanks to um, the Junior League. 
and here you see a map of how we are asking guests to navigate around the rancho. Come up the drive, go across the, in front of the visitor center, and one way loop around through the native garden and back in through the orchard and clockwise around the backyard. Now, if somebody's in a wheelchair or a walker or don't want to walk so far, you can take a shortcut through the forecourt and then go through the veranda, cut through the middle of the backyard and continue out the same way. And we see that here. And here is the stops of the different um, uh, places on the Clio virtual app that you will find. And what else do we have? Ah, we have four of the beauties here at the Rancho. My favorite, the hibiscus schizopetalus, which you can find underneath the coral tree across from the Morton Bay Fig. And our brand new paver that we just got installed for our third volunteer, Gail Dermody, with 3,500 hours, was just added this past week. So, any questions? Um, Marsha was asking in the chat about children wearing masks and noticing that some children weren't wearing them. So could you clarify what the rules yes. are for them? So there are a few exceptions for who doesn't have to wear masks, and that is children that are two or younger. Um, people who have breathing problems are not required to wear the mask. Somebody that cannot take the mask off themselves do not have to wear the mask. Or if somebody is mentally challenged and they can't understand the need to wear the mask, then um, they don't have to wear the mask. But other than that, everybody wears masks. Anybody else? Okay, I think I'm turning it back over to Megan and she is going to tell us about, is that right? Yeah, I just put the, uh... The Clio.com is the um, website if you wanted to see that information. It's not just about the gardens, although it's extensively about the gardens and a lot of information that's really interesting um, transcends the different periods in time. The native garden information includes uh, how the native people, the Tongva, used um, various plants that we have planted there and why there is a native garden planted there. Uh, on the western perimeter of the rancho. In the backyard, it includes information about some of the plants. It includes information about the water tower and the Orno and the Virginia Country Club gate. So really um, sort of weaving together the social, cultural, and environmental history of um, the rancho. Uh, we will add to our um, our site's information, uh, more about the house, the rooms of the house, as we are able to open the rooms of the house. Um, the, probably the first thing we'll be able to open is the courtyard. Um, not quite yet, um, but, but not too far in the distant future. And then the main house as well. So thank you to everyone who is coming to volunteer, if you possibly can, as a greeter, as a wayfinder, as a gardener. Um, increasingly, we'll have more opportunities. Thank you to those who have sent me um, any typos or anything else you see on our Clio entry. We want to have that as good as possible. Um, and uh, thanks to those who are just coming to visit the Rancho again. That is just so wonderful to have all of you back on site. If you can't visit right now, um, we do have virtual programming, including this, going on, so we're glad you can join us for that. We're going to have some more virtual programming over the summer, and Alana is going to tell you about two things that are coming up, one for children and one for teens. Um, some of you might be too old for this and not have any family members in the right demographic group, but in case you know anyone who might be interested, uh, neighbors, friends, or what have you. Alana, take it away. 
All right. So um, a lot of you probably know that over the summer, we usually have a lot of uh, family events like Mud Mania and camp. And with our new normal, those it became clear that those couldn't um, continue the way they had. And so camp is my particular project. And in looking at the options of having an on-site but socially distant camp or trying something else, um, we made the decision to go with virtual summer camp for this summer. So you might be wondering, what does virtual summer camp look like? Um, and what we have come up with is a combination of some live Zoom activities, kind of like this, where, where there is a little bit of that face-to-face -face interaction and we can do some of the games and um, get a little bit of that sort of in-person feel. Um, and then a lot of crafts and activities and games that the children can work on at home in between these live Zoom portions. And we will pack up kits that they can pick up or have mailed for an extra fee. And those kits will have all of the specialty supplies. So anything they wouldn't have at home um, in order to do all of these activities. So at the beginning and end of the day, there will be just a time to sort of check in and say hello to one another, maybe share some of the crafts that they've made. Um, and then throughout the day, there will also be um, a sort of get moving activity. So it's got a little bit of that physical fitness and activity aspect. And then also um, some guest speakers who will share some knowledge a little bit like uh, Steve shared with us today. Um, and then the kids can ask questions about that too. So we're trying to still keep the spirit of what made our camp so fun and unique in the past and then just translating it to a virtual format. Um, so if you have any kids between the ages of um, five and 13, we'll have two camps that are for elementary school aged. Um, so one is time travelers camp and each day will be a different time period of the rancho's history. And then one will be nature camp. So highlighting the nature of Rancho Los Cerritos, but then also doing some um, crafts and activities from the nature in their own backyard or in their own neighborhood. And then our third camp is for middle schoolers. And it has always, since I've been here, it's been called Unplugged because it was supposed to be getting away from the tablets and the phones and the computers. Um, but if you're doing a virtual camp, it's going to be replugged. So it, again, is still going to try to keep some of the spirit of those same activities, but still have some of that plugged in aspect just because of the situation that we're in. Um, so this also means that it's our team volunteering for the summer will probably look a little bit different too. So we have had teams do some gardening in the in past years and that it's Marie's green team. So that can kind of continue in the same way. The gardening is pretty socially distanced anyway. Um, and then we can also empower some teens to learn some of these roles that those of you who have been staffing our open hours so far have been doing, um, greeting guests and helping them find their way and along the path and also helping me maintain that sanitization schedule. Um, and then instead of the in-person camp, what we now have is there will be some volunteer opportunities for pre preparing some of the materials and then packing up those supplies kits that we will be um, giving to the families. So it, again, like everything else, it might look a little bit different, but we're still very excited to offer some opportunities for teens who are interested in volunteering and helping the community and the site. Um, and we will be having um, an information session via Zoom uh, one week from today. So next Tuesday at 2 p.m. And so if you know of any teens who are interested, um, feel free to send them my way and I can give them a little more information and um, let them know what the link is for that event. Um, so uh, like everything else, it's not quite how I thought it was gonna happen, but still really excited um, to see what it's gonna look like. And I think um, that it's still gonna be a lot of fun and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions. I haven't seen any in the chats. Um, 
but you can also feel free to email me and I can put my email into the chat. Otherwise it's in quick notes and on our website if you have any questions. And one thing to note is that because the camp doesn't, isn't on site, if you have um, family members or friends with kids who live far away, they can still participate. Um, we can mail those if it's just about $15 to have it mailed to them um, that they would have to pay on top of the participation fee. Um, but again, if you have any questions, please um, contact me and I can get you more information about that. And we'd love to have all of your little children that you know participate. <laughs> and I think that is all for me. So I'm turning it back over to Megan. Things are starting to change and starting to go back to normal. So anybody want to share something that they have recently done again that they hadn't done for yeah, like 10 weeks? Uh, well, I would like to start out by pointing out um, a brand new volunteer over here. You see Jan. You see Jan uh, Where's Vicky? Yes. <laughs> came close. Yeah. Is, uh, she came and visited this last week and she is going to start in as a curatorial volunteer whenever we um, reach phase three. And we're really excited to have her on board. And mm -hmm. our other new volunteer you see right there you, next to Martin, you see Joyce. And as you all saw, she has already started volunteering in the garden as well as in the afternoon with public tours. So um, I'll share my exciting news just before we started today. Both of my children showed up at my house and my daughter is making me dinner. So while we speak. <laughs> So that hasn't something that hasn't happened for a very long time, and I'm very excited. Tomorrow is my 53rd wedding anniversary, and since we are, yes, I'm probably the longest married person in California, but okay. <laughs> and I was married at three, uh, but uh, we are art collectors, and since we don't go out, we decided to purchase a piece by Mark Castavi. Mark is the youngest artist to ever exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. His piece was accepted when he was 28 years old, so I'm very pleased to have one of his pieces. He is world famous. His parents are from Estonia and um very very successful man and happy for him happy for me for tomorrow and uh we're taking our boat out to smell some fresh sea air and go visit the seals and dolphins okay. i don't know tomorrow is my birthday but it's not my <laughs> but i won't say which one it is but Diana, you were married on my birthday, so that's very nice. So we just like to yeah. thank Steve for the presentation that yeah. um, uh, we loved the last one about the, um, that Sarah did about the Tongva and learning more about the uh, Chinese workers. It, it's great to hear about all the, all the different, um, all the different peoples that make up the rancho that we often don't talk as much about. So thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's see, I see a question here. Oh, um, Steve, we have a, a belated question. Uh, Lynn Brubeck wanted to know if you know if Ying kept working with the Bixby's after they moved away from the Rancho. Uh, yes, he was still the cook here at the Rancho because you still had quite a crew of workers that were necessary to um, oversee the sheep. And there was also several hundred acres of crops that were planted. Um, 
the barley field at the coast was had been converted to part of the Wilmore City slash Long Beach um, tract, but uh, there was still a lot of other lands that had to be farmed, and you had quite a crew during harvest season and threshing and all of that. The um, as far as we know, Ying was here at least through 1888, and I, I just don't remember any details beyond that, but I think he had uh, probably amassed enough uh, money to go back to China and, and live that ideal life that was uh, prized so much by the Chinese who came to work here. Okay. Uh, didn't, didn't Laura, Laura, didn't um, Bixby pay for one of them to go back? That was part of the plan that they paid for him to go back to China. I don't remember which one it was, but one of them. Does Steve know about that? Uh, that was the one whose photograph I showed, who was uh, Augusta Simon Bixby's cook, Kuo Lang. He had apparently given them that photograph immediately before he went back to China for uh, an extended stay. And then he came back and served with the same family, if I remember right. And this is found in the, in the, um, in the accession file, because this was given by Florence, uh, Florence Lydia Bixby, who was a descendant of, uh, in fact, the daughter of Augustus Simon Bixby. Apparently, Kuo Lang came back and worked for the family from 1876 to 78. If I, and that's as close as I remember. Great. All right. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything before we get going? Alana. Um, we have uh, Sandra over in YouTube said that this week she and her dad planted an avocado tree. So that's very exciting. <laughs> very yummy. Yes, hello. <laughs> but I have. <laughs> it was a great meeting. Steve, thank you, thank you yeah. for the yeah. information. I loved it all. Very fun. It's nice to see everybody <laughs> in virtual. <laughs> Yeah. It looks like Lynn Brubeck has unmuted herself. Yes, I wanted to thank Steve too. It was a very interesting presentation. I was just showing you my son and his dog. I got to travel up to San Luis Obispo this weekend, which seems like such a treat and used to be so natural. <laughs> <laughs> Always fun to do something a little different. All right, then, I think we are going to be able to uh, wind this up right on time at seven before uh, I let you go. Just a reminder that we will be doing this again next month on uh, July 21st, same time, same place. Um, on Wednesday morning, we will have our virtual coffee hour. So look for an invite, and if you'd like to come to that, that's, we won't, it's not much planned. It's just getting together and talking. Maybe we'll try some sort of game that we can figure out, but um, very casual. And I think we will probably be able to start having, open up the courtyard sometime next month. We don't know exactly when, but um, we're going to be able to expand a little bit. So um, we'll be happy to see you all come back and see the Rancho uh, in this new way. So, adios amigas. <laughs>